All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, Christian Ricariot, I'm a head of product marketing at uh, Intel. Um, the Integrated Photonics um, Division or Integrated Photonics Solutions Group at Intel, uh, formerly known as SPPD, for those of you that remember that name. And today I'm going to talk to you about a new kind of, as we see it, optical interfaces, integrated photonics for this kind of new optic, new. Uh, AI infrastructure requirements, many of which were mentioned by the other speakers today. So I hope to give you our perspective on, on how that's going. And uh, it helps if I connect my clicker. There we go. All right, first, um, the problem statement, many of which have, have, many of you have seen this in the past. A couple of slides shown uh, already a couple of years ago in 2022, uh, one of on them on the, on the left by Catherine Schmidtke, who, uh, who was at Meta at the time. Uh, she, and she um, tried to show there the, the, the widening gap between the performance of compute and the evolution of compute with um, a, a bandwidth access, uh, access bandwidth to both memory and uh, interconnect bandwidth. And the one on the right is a slide shown by Craig uh, Thompson um, at NVIDIA, um, where he shows that pluggables at the time even were not expected to be able to fulfill the requirements in both power and cost and, and uh, bandwidth uh, density. And another way to look at this problem is the well-known Keeler chart or DARPA chart by others where the figure of merit of a bandwidth density and by energy efficiency as a function of the link um, length is shown. And as you can see there, the, for anything under a meter, which is um, within the chassis or within even the rack or a small rack, um, copper is more than adequate to meet those uh, band bandwidth density requirements. Uh, however, as we go beyond the rack, as we go into links that are a meter and, and, and above, uh, we need to go optical. Um, as we all know, uh, pluggable transceivers today or are expected to have or have had um, a low figure of merit for bandwidth density and, uh, and uh, energy efficiency. Um, things like, of course, LPO, LRO, and all the other things we're trying to do as an industry will help ameliorate this and perhaps raise that curve on, on the right. But um, we believe it's far from getting us to the top right uh, corner or quadrant of the chart, which is where we need to be. And um, we believe integrated photonics will play a, a significant role in, in, uh, in meeting that requirement. Uh, so what are the primary applications uh, for these uh, kinds of solutions? Uh, obviously, one is uh, GPU clusters. Call it upscale, call it outscale, but essentially, you know, GPUs talking to each other, nodes of GPUs talking to each other, or switch fabrics, uh, optical switch fabrics even. Uh, applications that are, in many cases, most cases, primarily bookended or greenfield. Right? They, they don't have the legacy uh, burden or interconnectivity requirements to Ethernet PMDs, for example. So they allow us uh, an opportunity to make that, to, to, those parameters more efficient for the particular application. Uh, this have you know, high bandwidth density, of course, uh, low latency, low power, and so on. The subsequent application or secondary applications is resource disaggregation. Uh, which aims, of course, to uh, make the use of those computer resources as, as efficient as possible. And by this, we mean um, pools of resources like H, you know, H, either HPM or maybe CX, CXL-based memory pools and so on, which have similar requirements in, with respect to uh, bandwidth density, with respect to low power and, uh, and, uh, and latency as the, as the clusters that I showed um, earlier. So as we try to tabulate the, the relevant parameters as well as the, the, the worthy KPIs that we should strive to, to achieve, um, we put together this chart that shows parameters like um, bandwidth density or shoreline density in, specifically, and uh, numbers like 1.6 terabit per second per millimeter, something that we are trying to strive, and many have, others have also published this number. This correlates, depending on the application, with the bandwidth per fiber as well where we think a, uh, numbers like two terabit per second per fiber can be achieved. Uh, energy efficiency is obviously a, an important parameter um, where low, low single digit numbers, like three and a half picojoules per bit or below, uh, is, is uh, within our, our, um, our, our line of sight, but certainly not there yet. 
uh, cost is always the case. And as you can see, you know, integration, 3D packaging, they're all playing a role in our view in this all of in, in improving and reaching all these KPIs. Certainly the economics of silicon would help with cost and that's one of our primary um, uh, benefits that we see in using silicon photonics. Uh, latency, obviously, we mentioned that as any, especially any, any kind of uh, cash coherent applications, but not only that. And then, obviously, reliability that has been brought up by, by Drew and many others in, in the past. Reliability is becoming more important as we go into uh, higher bandwidth densities, larger number of components, uh, certainly massive parallel links that many of these are, are, are going to implement. Uh, we need a highly reliable solutions, uh, starting with the optics, but not only the optics, as, as Drew uh, well said earlier um, in, the, in the day. So some history of, of, of perspective in, in our view of silicon photonics. We've been um, deploying and, and shipping, like Vlad says, silicon photonics now for seven years, eight years since 2016. We've been um, working on, on, on that uh, for, for over 20 years at Intel. Um, when we started shipping 100G CWDM4, uh, we were just below 100 devices per, uh, per pick. Uh, right now, in kind of the solutions or the picks that we're, I'm going to show you in, in a couple of slides, we're around 2,000, was just below 2,000 devices per pick. So the technology has scaled very well, functionality, performance. Uh, we don't think it will stop there. We're heavily investing in multiple vectors to, to make sure that that, that ramp, that the scaling continues um, with respect to the, the, the performance of the technology and, and the cost, and the cost improvement. So what's our approach for this particular um, application? It's what we call an OCI chiplet. OCI stands for Optical Compute Interconnect, which is another way of saying XPU Optical I.O. Um, and it is a chiplet that I will describe in a second, just to um, answer Vlad's question, CPO versus OCI. Obviously, this is a co-packaged application. We tend to use CPO in the context of, of Ethernet, of networking CPO, uh, as a majority of people have used it so far. Um, increasingly so, people are talking about XPO interconnect, and that's what we differentiate. Anything that's a compute interconnect, we tend to call OCI, uh, while we leave CPO for networking uh, applications. But again, you, they can, you can argue you can use those interchangeably. Um, so the solution is essentially a, 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 it's a die stack, it's a chiplet that uh, consists of a PIC and an EIC. The PIC has a highly integrated functionality. Um, it has not only the typical silicon photonics um, uh, components, and, you know, MUX, DMUX, um, ring modulators, and so on, but also it has the lasers, it has DWDM uh, on-chip lasers and SOAs, uh, so highly uh, integrated, high functionality uh, device based on our 300 millimeter um, manufacturing, wave for manufacturing and, and testing technology that, again, we've, we've been shipping for, for the last se uh, seven years in, in volume. Um, Again, die stack with an EIC that has the um, additional functionality, laser driver, TIA, um, control circuitry, and eventually we'll also have the service to have a low um, speed, um, wider um, interface to the host. Um, that uh, chiplet is independent, it's heterogeneously integrated, essentially to make sure that we, um, that that chip can evolve and can improve um, independently from the PIC. So it can use, for example, the latest and greatest CMOS nodes if needed, uh, regardless of what the silicon photonics platform does for the PIC. Uh, that chip, that of course, will be very tightly integrated uh, to the host, to typically through system co-developments, um, where we would provide you know, known, you know, well-tested, uh, known good component at the chiplet level that can be integrated uh, with the system on a chip or whatever uh, is on the host. A little bit more um, detail on, on the devices. Um, the pick that we are currently that we currently have on this on this chiplet uh, is an eight terabit pick. Um, it is it has eight DWDM uh, wavelengths uh, with a 200 gigahertz spacing um, over eight fibers in each direction. Uh, each one of those uh, channels can run up to 64 gigabit per second. So that's a total of four terabit uh, per direction. Uh, for a total of eight terabit per direction. As you will see later on, the chiplet is actually running at half that speed. Uh, we're limited right now by the EIC uh, for now. Um, but the, the PIC itself can already provide uh, twice the bandwidth or twice the throughput uh, of what we can, we will, we will show in today. Uh, again, as I mentioned, this has a, you know, it's a fully integrated subsys optical subsystem with the, the lasers, the SOAs, the ring modulators, uh, and of course, um, MUX, DMUX, and waveguys, and so on. Um, 
So uh, V-group alignment in this case, as, as, as you will see in a picture, we're working on connectivity, but this is a still aligned uh, via V-groups. The, the laser we're using is obviously um, what we are, have been shipping so far is our um, um, hybrid laser where we heterogeneously integrate um, the um, lacing material, the indium phosphide, on the silicon wafer. We don't manufacture the laser and then flip chip on top. We, we don't do that. We'd rather um, um, deposit the material on the, on the silicon wafer and grow the laser there. So there's a very intimate uh, connection um, or interface between uh, the laser and, and the silicon. So we have no exposed facets um, that improve, you know, minimum coupling losses, maximum performance, and, and very high reliability. The, the numbers, and we've mentioned this in the past, the numbers of uh, reliability we're seeing over uh, both in field fit, over many millions of devices, which were counted and kept track by one of our large hyperscale customers, showed um, laser fit well under 0 0.1 fit. Uh, we've corroborated this number uh, through internal testing, HTOL cells uh, with over 50,000 lasers um, that we put in our cells, and we've corroborated that field data uh, to be under 0.1 um, fit. Again, very high reliability, volume proven, so we, we think it's a, it's a good proof point to, to show how the technology from now on can scale and, and can have the performance that we need for this kind of new AI applications. So again, coming back to the chiplet, um, in this case, this first generation chiplet has a direct drive or linear interface uh, to, the, to the host, to the XPU on the host. We mentioned performance already, eight fibers by eight lambda by 32 gigabit per second. Um, and um, this is actually has, uh, has shown reliability uh, or actually performance of up to uh, 10 to the minus 12 with um, five picojoules per bit, which is not at three and a half, but it's close to where we want to be, but not yet. We've co-packaged this chiplet with uh, a, a mainstream Intel data center CPU that um, uh, allowed us to test and demonstrate and learn from the platform and also demonstrate it to our customers. Uh, we showed this device at OFC running over Fiverr, uh, again, error-free PRBS 31 at 10 to the minus 12, uh, showing uh, the viability of the solution. Where do we go from here? We can increase or we can scale performance in many different ways. Uh, we can go higher wavelength count. We can go larger number of fibers, depending on whether higher rate is required or not. And of course, we can increase line rate, which is probably the easiest one at the beginning. And what we do first will depend on what our customers want. Our current view of our, our solutions is a PCIe version, maybe PCIe 6, that will um, a, quadruple the performance we're showing today, as well as an Ethernet version that has P either FR or DR uh, interfaces, depending on what the customer wants for on Radix, 200 gigabit per lane interface to the host, and then one that implements maybe UCIE die-to-die -die interface to lower the power, uh, given that now we have the service on the, on the, on the chiplet and we can actually um, make, you know, des design decisions for energy efficiency. And that's where we think that at the bottom right there, we can hit all the KPI numbers with this uh, 32 terabit per second um, chiplet. So last slide. In summary, we, um, we believe there is a new kind of optics required. We think that we have a good technology. We've proven those proof points, we believe, early on with this early um, prototypes, if you will, or prototype design, um, and uh, we have a good roadmap, we believe, to scale this technology, and our, our call to action is essentially to contact us. Uh, we're ready to start working with you on such uh, co-developments um, for uh, your interconnect needs. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Christian. Thank you. Sorry, no time for questions. No worries. Okay. It's a tough schedule here.